I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight for this, special, this task special encounter event. We are delighted by the opportunity to host the Reverend Jesse Jackson. He is a tireless campaigner for equality and his work shows that inequality is not just a problem in Ireland but remains a major problem in the way the economy is governed in the United States of America also. During the boom times, economics in Ireland was more like Boston, less like Berlin, but we may have focused too much attention on the glitz of Wall Street and not enough on Main Street America. If we had, we might have seen a different side of life in America and a dark side to unregulated economics that Jesse Jackson has been campaigning to make visible. 49 million Americans in poverty, 59 million Americans without health insurance, millions of Americans working but who can't afford rent. Poverty and inequality are much more common problems in the USA than many of us think. And Jesse Jackson's work is a reminder that an unregulated economy will not only fail to solve all of our problems, but is often the root cause of many of them. He has campaigned to change the national debate in the US by talking about poverty, reconstruction, racial justice, and economic justice. And economic justice is a, a striking term. We want our economy to work in a way that will deliver the kind of equality and social justice that we're looking for. And this is not the first time that a prominent black American has visited Ireland. In 1845, Fred Frederick Douglass gave over 50 talks across Ireland. Douglass had escaped from slavery in Maryland in 1838 and had become a major figure in the abolitionist campaign. Slavery had been abolished in Britain and Ireland only a few years earlier, in 1833. So Douglass came here to speak in, in support of the abolitionist campaign who were then trying to use their influence here to end slavery in America. And Douglas built a strong relationship with Daniel O'Connell, who had succeeded in his campaign for Catholic emancipation less than two decades earlier, in 1829. And Daniel O'Connell was an outspoken and lifelong opponent of slavery. And this position cost him support among some people who felt that Ireland should focus solely on its own problems. Jesse Jackson's visit is also not the first such visit at a time when the Irish economy and society are in great crisis. When Douglas came to Ireland, the Great Famine was just beginning. And Douglas could not help but notice the poverty that was evident when he travelled around. He wrote, I see much here to remind me of my former condition, and I confess, should be ashamed to lift my voice against American slavery, but that I know the cause of humanity is one the world over. Jesse Jackson's life work is testament to the same values, that the cause of humanity is one the world over. He has argued on behalf of all minorities and everyone who is affected by poverty and inequality. This brings me on to the work the task does. Part of the crisis we face in Ireland today in the economy society and politics is a great famine of ideas. We need to seriously consider a much wider range of alternative ideas about how we organize and govern our economy and how we can achieve a stable, sustainable economy with equality. TASC is an independent think tank reliant on donations and philanthropy. We conduct research and analysis to generate ideas and alternative progressive policies with the goal of rebuilding the economy and creating a more equal society. We're currently looking at job creation, tax reform, open government and health. And we have a few more ideas in development too. This morning, Reverend Jackson launched the roadmap campaign of the Equality and Rights Alliance. And one thing he said struck a chord with many people in the room. The budget is a moral document. In the aftermath of four austerity budgets that have been remarkably unjust, 
One of TASC's major projects later this year will be our equality budget, based on our partnership with the Canadian think tank, which will show how we can deal with the deficit in a way that's better for the economy and better in terms of social justice and equality. If you would like to keep in touch with us, you can sign up to our free TaskNet membership and receive occasional emails about our work and about events like this. You can find information on our website, www.tasknet.ie. That's TaskNet with a, a C. There's also a task stand outside, and our team will be happy to talk to you about our ideas. At this point, before the Reverend Jackson joins us, I just want to hand you over to our, your host for this evening. Can you please join me in welcoming one of RTE's leading broadcasters and historian, Mr. Miles Dungan. Good evening. Ask most people to name the three most important and influential African-American political figures, and they'll probably start in the present day with Barack Obama. Then they may go back almost half a century to the great civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King. Then, without a pause, they will probably fasten on a transitional figure who was and still is a huge influence on American politics and society. He worked with Dr. King in the 60s, established his own humanitarian organization in Chicago in the 70s, ran twice for the Democratic nomination for the presidency in 1984 and 1988. Arguably, without his paving of the way, the presidency of Barack Obama in 2008 might not have happened. He's been a spokesperson for African Americans and for the poor, oppressed and underprivileged worldwide for most of his 69 years. Would you please welcome the Reverend Jesse Jackson. take you through through the biography first a, a lot of biography born in 1941 do you have dim memories even of America at war or America in the immediate post-war period my most vivid memory in life was sitting up in the bed with my mother looking at the photo of the battalion my father was in the military and her saying that that will be home soon. And on furlough, that may have been the first word I ever remember, on furlough. A few days, he's coming up the hill, duffel bag on his back, flag on the porch, and we welcomed him home. And then I saw this man in my life for the first time, this heroic figure. Came home, he hugged my mom, he gave me some candy, picked me up. Then he had to leave, go back to get his papers for his honorable discharge. Then I remember him talking about how black soldiers who would come to Europe to fight had to sit behind Nazi POWs. And on military bases, Nazi POWs had privileges that they didn't have on the base and how fractured his feelings were about that. And I remember one day, lastly, uh, after he was discharged, without cutting grass and raking leaves, in the white neighborhood. A man came down the steps, immaculately dressed, and talking, we said, talking funny. He was talking different than whites tend to talk in the South. I said, what is this guy? And I looked up and he was crying, with a rake in his hand against a tree. It was, it was overwhelming to me to see him. Why are you crying? Look, we went to fight those guys to set America free. He can go downtown and work and vote, and I cannot. He just, but don't worry, you stay in school, Mom and I will handle that. So I remember this, his coming home, and I remember just how shattered he was, uh, that lots of POWs had rights that black soldiers did not have, and yet he was determined to overcome that. And so it's, it's that. And I grew up in rigidly segregated, apartheid, South Carolina. 
remember the, uh, I, the parents saying, you're going to school next year, you're going to school next year. And about a mile and a half from our house, we could see a nice brick schoolhouse. And it had merry-go-rounds and it had uh, sliding boards and tulips in front of the, of the uh, school. And I just looked forward to going to school. Then in my mind, we used to walk about three miles to church every Sunday morning on the other side of the town. And that was a school that didn't have any grass. All merry-go-rounds, all sliding boards. But we had to walk through that yard going to church. So in my own subconscious mind, at five and a half or so, no, that was not the school for me because it was too far away from home. The day we walked out of the door, and I kind of made a break toward that school, Mom said, no, we're going this way. I was six. And uh, we went to that school where we went double shifts, 8 to 12 and 12, 15 to 4. And uh, one book for six of us. Sometimes three or four years after whites had used the books and wrote in those books. And so we grew up in that kind of segregation. But I learned early on from my mom who, after the first day of school, then met with my teacher and then took me to church that Sunday to have prayer that we had to learn to be insulated within that system, but not isolated. We, we were isolated uh, from the bigger culture, the kind of spiritual insulation. So that's kind of the, the kind of infrastructure of my development. Your mother, Helen, was 16 years old and single when you were born, so you were black, living in the South, the son of a teenage single mother whose father was married to someone else. Not on the face of it, a great start in life. Well, I do not remember ever not having a father. She married my father who adopted me when I was one. And so I was Jesse Burns. I had my grandmother's name until I was 12. Then I was adopted and became Jesse Jackson because I had a brother named Charles Jackson. My mother wanted, you know, one name in the house. And so I was never fatherless. In many ways, I was fortunate because I had two fathers because my natural father and my father who adopted me were, were friends. Uh, they became friends. And so I was somewhat protected by loving mom, dads, and grandmom. So I did not feel uh, a sense of loss in that sense. I understand what the fracture represents, but also know that, that uh, mothers and fathers can compensate and can give children nurturing strength. Much of my inner strength and dreams and ambitions come from their encouraging me and giving me a kind of boost and protection. And in addition to the educational segregation that you've just described, how else did segregation manifest itself to, to a young child in South Carolina? Well, we would go down town and could not drink water at the fountain, said colored and white. The toilets were colored and white. Uh, we could not go to the zoo uh, only for certain special occasions. Uh, we could not go to eat at the, 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 the fountain at the, at the drugstore. There was not one black policeman in town, nor fireman, nor city hall worker. After all, we didn't have the right to vote. And uh, whites could use the skating rink and organize ball and the swimming. So we were locked out of all of those social amenities and learned to live in our own little world. And even limited by those walls, you can dream above walls. You need not be limited. You can be in a hole and dream of being on the mountaintop. You can be in jail and dream of being free. And somewhere along the way, my sense of dreaming and hope was inspired and convinced by my parents that nothing was wrong with me. Something was wrong with the system. It was not that I could not compete with them. They were afraid to compete with me. And we lived on University Ridge, which is Furman University, Baptist University. My parents washed the ch clothes of the children at Furman. We could not apply to Furman. But they were blocked from our house to Serene Stadium, so we would park the cars on football days and 25 cents a park car and go to the stadium and sell peanuts and sell cokes as a way of making money, staying busy, a little entrepreneur, if you will. But we knew very well that we were locked in 
by the laws of race. And, and maybe the most traumatic moment was my grandfather in the woodyard. He sold wood and coal, wood for 20 cents a basket and coal a dollar a sack. And um, he would let me sit in front of the truck. And at the third grade, uh, I could count. He would let me count the money. The other guys working on the truck for him, they could not count, and neither could he. But I learned to count and be account for the money, maybe eight years old. And so I was teaching me to become a little man, a little responsible guy. So one day we went downtown with my mom, and grandparents always give you more leeway than, than, than parents do. So we got on the bus, and uh, as she walked, I sat right down behind the driver, because I was used to sitting behind the driver. And there were three white kids sitting across in front of me. And um, the driver said, uh, we must have some order on this bus. Well, he couldn't have been talking to me because I was sitting alone, the three white kids in front of me. And they were not boisterous, they were just having fun. Must be some order on this bus. He was really talking to those blacks on the back where my mother was. And she cut on, she came and pulled me. I said, I don't, I don't want to move. She pinched me, and I was humiliated, and I cried. I went to the back of the bus, and, um, and he said, look at that sign. The sign above the driver's head read, colored seat from the rear, whites from the front, those who violate will be punished by law. Read that sign. It says, caution. So I went to the back of the bus. I remember one of my father's friends, Mr. Yates, saying, your mother pinched you because she loved you. I couldn't reconcile that. Uh, and said, you know, uh, the back of the bus will get what the front will get. And if the bus have a wreck, those in the front, in the back won't get hurt. They don't want to sit next to you, don't sit next to them. You know, black the very sweet of the juice, black is honorable. He was trying to build a cushion of protection around me that it was not so bad. The back would get what the front would get. He was conditioning me to live on the back in his own way of loving. He was not preparing me to fight to change those rules. That's where Dr. King comes in. But you learn the conditioning process. Um, and one thing worse than slavery or segregation is to adjust to it and be conditioned by it. The reason why most oppressed people don't rebel, they have been conditioned and learn that that limited space is their lot. Your stepfather was a baseball player. You yourself are a fantastic, or were a fantastic athlete. I'm sure you still are. Um, he was a baseball player at a time when blacks were just beginning to break into major league teams. And he wasn't one of the, the lucky ones. Or was he? Because how hard was it for the likes of somebody I know you admire greatly and you've spoken about, Jackie Robinson uh, of, the, of the Brooklyn Dodgers. How hard was it for somebody like that to break into one of the, the major areas of, of, let's face it, public life in America? Sports is public life. He played a, a high caliber of baseball. So during the off season, people like Jackie Robinson and Don Newcomb and Roy Campanella would do what they call barn and they would have their own tour. The Jack Robinson All-Stars, the Don Lucan, who's a great pitcher, All-Stars, and they would come south to play guys they knew were at their level. And so I ended up being the bat boy in many instances for Don Lucan and people like that. And to watch him play and to be around his friends was a source of inspiration to my inclination toward baseball and toward, and toward athletics. Uh, but to see people like my dad have their dreams shortened or artificial roofs on their heads uh, was a source of um, pain and yet we, we rationalized it will get there. Somehow it did not break our spirit. It was a detour. It was not a stop. And in the end, uh, those uh, athletes, athletics became a way out. If I, I was able to go to a a baseball camp for whites only, I developed some reputation. And I kind of had the option of going the baseball route or going football. Football was a college scholarship. Now I felt more secure going in that direction, but my sense of athleticism and athletics as a way out because, I face it, my parents could not afford to send me to college. But athletics became the way out. But somebody like Jackie Robinson, and I think like Muhammad Ali, 
were much more than sportsmen. I mean, you, you, you came to know them and you came to respect them, but they were also, uh, in a sense, they were maybe with a small p, political figures. Uh, Jack Robinson was this dynamic figure. After you have Joe Lewis in 1937 defeating Max Smelling, which was a huge global event as they paraded Smelling as this German force for power in the world, and Joe Lewis defeated him. And so the quote unquote least of us defeated the Aryan superior athlete. Though uh, Smelling never identified in the public way with the Nazi movement, he came out of Germany, he was being touted. Julius defeating Max Smelling was a big deal. I later met him, I eulogized him, for example, as a matter of fact, and Jack Robinson likewise. But Jack had this extra something, very eloquent, articulate guy. And in the off season, he would go around the country giving speeches at NAACP banquets. He would attract people on his uh, persona and his fame to come to civil rights banquets. He had that sense of, of social justice beyond just the playing field. And in 1959, he came to Greenville, South Carolina, spoke at the state NAAC, National Association of Advancement of Colored People, Civil Rights Convention. And when Reverend Hall and his wife, my pastor, took him to the airport, she wanted to sit in the section that was clean, the white section. She was ordered to get up and she would not move. And Reverend Hall stood by her. Jack was getting his ticket to get on the plane to go back to New York. And he said, if you don't move, I will stand with you. By that time, people gathered around and the plane came and he left. He said, but if you need me to come back, uh, I will come back and we'll do a rally together. This was Jackie Robinson. <clears throat> that was January 1st, 1960. That was uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed January 1st, 1863. So it was kind of Emancipation Day that they marched on the airport 1500 demanding that the federal territory be opened up. Uh, I had gone back to school by that time. But that Christmas, I'd come home and I had to do a speech with 25 annotated bibliographies. And I went to the library for the colored, and uh, Mrs. Smith said, I don't have this number of books. But my friend at the Central Library will get you the books. I will call her, and she wrote her name down. And the fact that she called, I said, I'll go immediately. So I ran all the way down to the library. By the time I got there, two police just happened to be there. You know, police hang around libraries. You know, <laughs> what police do. And I gave her a note. She said, well, I talked with Mr. Smith. I'll have him for you in six days. So this is my vacation, I, my Christmas vacation. I need them now. She said, six days. So I said, since we're in the library alone, may I go down in the stacks and, uh, and get them myself? The police said, you heard what she said, and I got it. I mean, it, it occurred to me they were there because she had called them. And so I went out the back door and stood by the Veterans Memorial statue. And I wept because I thought about my father. Having gone through the war and risked his life and lost friends and had to stand behind Nazis. And I could not use the library. And I said, this summer I plan to use the library. It was like a matter of fact. I didn't realize that January, just two weeks later, that would be a march on it. And that summer we came home, seven classmates. And um, we determined to go to the library. Reverend Hall uh, prepared us with, uh, uh, he was very connected with Dr. King and the movement at that time. So I remember we would say, if they curse you, don't respond. If they push you, don't push back. If they put a cigarette on your neck, don't fight back. This is nonviolent discipline. So we went to that process. And so, and you're going to jail to protest this law. So I remember us leaving the church. We got to the library and the police knew we were coming. They said, we'll give you the count of three. You must leave or go to jail. So they counted one, and they counted two, and we left. We got back to the church and Reverend Hall said, why are you back? We said, well, they were going to arrest us. He said, that's why I sent you. Go get the arrest. <laughs> I went, I went back to jail the second time. <laughs> and yet that arrest on that day was a kind of a defining moment for me personally. And for our struggle because I never 
But to stop fighting, marching, sitting, I kind of grew up that day and took with me a certain pride and a certain dignity. But I should never forget my father, who had given me a sense of pride, a sense of fight back, how when I came home, what his reaction was. Now, here's a guy who had said over and over again how he felt violated in World War II. Uh, Strom Thurmond came to the soldiers in Europe, said to the black soldiers, you are here to fight a war, not to be with white girls. That you are here, uh, and some white soldier told white Europeans that blacks had tails. All the human nation went with that. And so he had that sense of resentment of what had happened to him. As a matter of fact, you should not have two sons from the same family be in the war at the same time. His brother was already in the war. He was shining shoes at a barbershop and said to Mr. Brown, I'm going to, my wife is pregnant, I'm going to move and go down to the hotel to work where I make more money. Mr. Brown said, you cannot go because you built up my business shining shoes. He said, I'm going because I have more responsibility. When dad went to change jobs, Mr. Brown went down to the, to the recruitment office and had him sent to the army to die because every white man was basically a deputy sheriff. And so he felt that in his bones. And I remember uh, when one Sunday after church, he was teaching my brother. Now, he had the keys to the bank. He worked at the bank, lawyer's office, and the judge's office. And we, uh, he was teaching us how to buff. The guy he worked for was ordinarily kind of kind guy. But that Sunday afternoon, Dad said, now, you see a $5 bill on the floor, it doesn't belong to you. They're testing, can I keep these keys? You use the buffer machine, you enter the, enter the pail. So the door opened. His, his boss walked in and said, hey, Charlie, come here. In that tone with two of his friends. And then it kept on duff buffing. Now, Charlie, you better come here. And I sensed, knowing my father, knowing that tone, what that meant to him. Uh, he said, Charlie, if you don't come, I'm going to kick you. So dad stopped. He had this big wad of keys on his belt. And he walked over to him. I did not know what was going to happen. He said, now you take these keys. You know my wife is sick. You know I have three jobs, all of them for you. It's Christmas time. Uh, I can't stop you from, taking the, from kicking me. But you can't take the leg back that you do the kicking with. So rather than get in trouble, you take these keys. And he, that, was, that defined my politics. In many ways, that defined principle over money and stuff, principle in the face of threat. And so this guy, who was being alive to me, I come back in the house, having gone to the public, having gone to jail, and I walk in the house, he was watching television, as he did on Sunday, Saturday afternoon. And I said, hi, Dad. I got a certain kind of, you know, hey, I went to the kitchen, make a sandwich. I heard him come. I could just hear a certain kind of step. Uh, you have no food in the, is there always enough food in the house? I said, yes. Is there extra meat and ice cream in the freezer? I said, yes. Well, you know, you're on, this, on TV, I see you down there going to jail. Uh, something about eating to something downtown like you're hungry. It had nothing to do with hunger. It was public library. Now, your mom's over there fixing hair, and so if you uh, keep on doing that kind of stuff, some of these fools might try to bomb out of a house, so maybe you should go back up, up where you go to school up yonder and do that. He was kind of regular, I leave home. It was out of his love and fear. I mean, this is the guy who had fought the fight from whom I learned my sense of standards. So we had to go through those chains of breaking out of that system. Later on, of course, I, as my work developed, and he would see my picture on magazines or something, he would work in the post office as, as a janitor. This is my boy, you know, he's, he's up, beyond, up beyond the fighting back. <laughs> But we had to go through the changes of becoming maladjusted and fighting back. And so uh, much of my life story was spawned in that season. Then as I began to play football, and I could not prepare to go to Furman or Clemson or University of South Carolina, the big name schools in the state, I was then able to go to the University of Illinois to play football at the Big Ten. It was a way to keep us from challenging the system. They would kind of send us away. And so it was that rigid system of segregation. So in that context, emerges out of Montgomery, Dr. King. Uh, 